hi, welcome back to the channel and to the second of our 10 walks between the Negresco Hotel in Nice and the Chapelle Santo Spice on Saint Jean Cap Ferrat. Today, we're going to make the journey from the chateau down into Nice Port, round Nice Port, and then along a spectacular coastal walk along to Coco Beach and then right up to the foot of Mont Baron. Along the way, we're going to discover why what this lady did to the Turkish flag made her a Niçoise heroine. We're going to uncover the secret of the 12 o'clock cannon, which daily frightens the wits out of tourists in Nice. We're going to have a nose into Sean Connery's old villa. And we're going to discover the story of the actress Renée Dahan and her fantastic sunset boulevard-like existence in the Palais Maeterlinck. So lace up your boots. Let's get going. So, getting seats, an absolutely fantastic day up here on the chateau, um, high above Nice, 93 meters above Nice. We are here. It's uh, where Nice began. It, the town was actually originally up here on top of a sort of limestone rock face um, and I'm now going to take you to the canon of Nice and tell you the story of why every day at 12 o'clock the tourists of Nice and indeed some of the locals get frightened out of their wits because all of a sudden there is this enormous explosion. <laughs> So the reason this cannon exists and that it frightens the wits out of everybody at 12 o'clock each day is because of um, an Englishman. I think he was English. He may have been Scottish, but he certainly was British, if you accept the old definition of Britishness. Uh, and it was a man called Sir Thomas Coventry. And uh, he, he was, well, it's fair to say he wasn't much of a feminist. Uh, and he in 1860 grew a bit tired of the fact that his wife didn't get his lunch on the table at dead on 12 every day and apparently the reason for this was that she you know uh, she had the cheat to sort of go out and see her friends and wander along the promenade des anglais and do nice things but he wasn't having this so he went and saw the mayor and he said look in my hometown in scotland we have a cannon and we fire it every day at 12 o'clock so we know what's what he said, why don't I get a cannon for you and install it at my own expense? And the mayor said, yes, fine. And so Sir Thomas installed this cannon and fired it every day at 12 o'clock. And bizarrely, when Sir Thomas left Nice, he took the cannon with him. But uh, Nice had decided by this point that it was part of the fabric of life. And so to this day, they fire the cannon at 12 o'clock. Uh, and it's, it's been done, I think, by the same man for about 35 years. And he's apparently he's a bit of a card because uh, he's been known on April Fool's Day to, um, to fire it early. Let's carry on now round towards the far side of the chateau. That's the opposite side to, uh, to Nice where you should get some fantastic views of Nice Port. And, uh, as we wind our way down here it's worth mentioning the name of Catherine Segaran because Catherine Segaran is still, she's a big name in Nice. She's given a name to Rue Segaran. There are still statues and memorials and things to her. Now, Catherine Segaran became famous uh, in, I think, the siege of the chateau, uh, which is up here where we are, in about 1543. And it was, uh, the town was under siege from a Franco-Turkish uh, uh, assault. Uh, obviously, a lot of the time this, uh, for right up until really the Risorgimento in 1860, of course, Nice was controlled from, I get in trouble for saying this, Italy, but well, controlled from Genoa. It certainly was not controlled by France. And uh, this particular uh, assault from the Franco-Turkish army, Catherine Segaran played a big part in. Now, Catherine was a, um, a washerwoman and she happened to be doing her washing as this assault came and legend has it that she picked up her uh, a brodel you know the thing that she uses to bash the washing and she bashed a couple of turks knocked them clean out she did and she grabbed their flag 
And not only did she do that, she climbed onto the castle ramparts with the flag, lifted her skirt and uh, wiped her bottom with it. Of course, nowadays this park is largely used as, uh, as a place for picnics and for people to come and do Tai Chi uh, and uh, play with the kids and there's lots of little cafes dotted around. Um, but do take the time to sort of do the whole perimeter of it because there are the most fantastic views of Nice. I mean, it really is a 360 degree uh, sort of viewing platform. You know, back there you can see the Promenade des Anglais and the old town. Over this side you can see the port. Uh, and then if you go up there, over back, you can see right into the, uh, into the mountains. And in about three or four weeks' time, there'll be snow in them there hills. So, having welcomed the Emirates jet, let's take a walk down now here to take a, take a view out into the Med. And we should, from this angle, be able to, well, to see Corsica. Now, that is a bit of a trick because, of course, Corsica is so far away, it is not actually visible. Um, by the naked eye and yet and yet on certain days you can see Corsica and it's all to do with the trick of the light uh, in that the reflection of Corsica bounces off the sea goes back into the thing it's very very complicated you can tell I understand it but the bottom line is on certain days you can see Corsica from Nice so we're heading now down towards the port side where we're going to begin our descent into Nice Port. Um, when you're here, if you're wandering around, do keep an eye out for the wonderful mosaics that are in the pavement and in the, some of the walls. Uh, they're absolutely charming. Um, and there's quite an interesting story because you look at them, you think, oh, they must be the work of a, a proper artist, but they weren't. They were the work of an artisan. I think they were the work of a, a stonemason who just happened to work for the council. Uh, and he always was amazed that people sort of took his work seriously. But I think they're absolutely beautiful. the old crane which is actually an electric crane but it's also an historic monument it's uh, if you like it's a listed crane and interestingly there is a plan to change this car park here which isn't very attractive into a sort of landscaped area where they're going to put uh, cafes and uh, park benches and that kind of thing right it's now time to make the descent from the chateau to Nice Port. So there are just hundreds of these fantastic little uh, footpaths that go right the way down into the port. Um, you literally could spend all day here. In fact, some gentlemen do. They're so keen on it, they, they hang out here. Very popular with, uh, with gentlemen, very. I think if we clamber down here, we should be getting a little bit nearer. Ah, yeah, I can see the sort of main road that brings you up here. If you're, uh, if you're the sort of person who doesn't fancy walking up here or you can't walk up here, there is one of those little touristic trains, you know, those little white things that you all sit on with earphones. Um, but it does come up here, it's part of the sort of uh, Nice Grand Tour, and I think you can get it on the Promenade des Anglais, right on the front by the, um, uh, by the entrance to the park. But we're back down into the port area now, and we're gonna head into the antique district, take a quick look at uh, some of the hundreds of antique shops that are in this town. Um, if you're an antique lover, then Nice is a bit heavenly because, well, this whole coastline is a bit heavenly because really 
every town and city on Tibes, Cannes, um, uh, Villefranche, Monton, uh, as all have uh, antique markets, uh, many of them weekly. Then in Nice here, you've got this huge sort of antique district with, as I say, about a hundred antique shops featuring all kinds of stuff. Um, and you've also got uh, the Marché aux Pousse, which is down here five, six days a week. So uh, if you're an antique lover, fill your boots. Take a little nosy into the, uh, the Pousse. So what you've got in here, lots of Lots of little, little shops selling all kinds of bits and bobs. <laughs> Recognise that photograph. I think it figured in last week's episode when we were talking about Plasmacena and the old tram terminus. Pretty certain that's where it is. Because you can see up here, look, is uh, what is now Gallery Lafayette. <laughs> And I think this at the time was the case. And if you come back out here and carry on up this road, you're then right into the sort of uh, the proper antique shops. I say proper, it probably just means you'll pay a bit more for it. Um, but there is some pretty fantastic high-end stuff in here. It's well worth spending an afternoon uh, having a nosy around. And what were we talking about earlier? Catherine Segaran, remember the woman who uh, wiped her bottom on the Turkish flag, allegedly? Well, this is her street, and it's one of the most uh, popular antique streets with some really nice uh, new sort of design boutiques on it now. I've never noticed this before. This is where, on the 2nd of December 1883, the philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche commenced his stays in Nice. Of course, Nietzsche round here is very famous for his passage. His passage, I mean, down from Es Village into Es Samer. It's a very famous walk where he wrote one of his uh, philosophical tracts, allegedly. Um, he wasn't a very happy soul, Nietzsche. And you may think you don't know much about him, but you know, he was the man who came up with the phrase, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. So I bet you knew that one. So, as you can see, both sides of this street, it's wall-to-wall -wall antiques. The old Eagle Gay Cruising Club. There's certainly a few antiques in there. And then, as you come around this corner, you're right in the heart of the port. I said to you before that Nice is attempting to become one of the greenest cities on the whole Mediterranean coast and these things have popped up everywhere. They're, uh, they're water uh, fountains but they serve still water, they serve fizzy water all for free and they even have up here for hot days a demister so you can stand under here and have a little shower all for free and the water comes straight from the mountains, apparently. And uh, this sculpture on the corner of the port is a, a relatively recent addition. Uh, I think it was put here really to, at the same time as the, um, the new tram line opened. And it's by, I think, a sculptor called Noel Dollar. And it's meant to represent, well, can you guess? It's meant to represent the three types of boat which sail from here. Actually, I guess when you get up close, you can sort of make out the three boats. Yeah, you can. I have to say, not everybody loves it. In fact, some friends of mine absolutely hate it. What do you think? Leave me a comment in the comments section. Are you a fan of this or uh, do you think it's a bit of an orange uh, abhorrence in the corner of the port. So let's head now down the far side of the port past uh, some of the Nisoir institutions over here, Mar Nolans. I head to uh, one of my favourite little food joints which I'm hoping is open because I'm absolutely bloody starving. Um, <laughs> uh, and we're going to have a little 
a little break and I'm going to introduce you to what the French call a bouvette. And uh, over here is one of the newer and more successful shops in Nice, uh, Café du Cycliste, which is, um, well, as the name suggests, it's a cyclist cafe. Uh, and it also does some quite high-end and, and rather nice uh, cycling here. In fact, I think there's now a branch in, in London town. And these, of course, are the traditional fishing boats, the Pointus. Um, I think there's still about 70 or 80 of them in Nice Port. Many of them these days motorised, but uh, still very popular traditional boats in beautiful colours. It's open! So this is a bouvette. Essentially, they're little sort of sandwich huts or food huts. Some of them are just takeaways. Some of them, like the one we go to in Cancer Mare, is on the beach. There's a few seats and tables, but they're often inexpensive and they can be very good. Now, can you guess what I'm going to order? What does that look like to you? Pambagnazzi, we'll play. For a change, I thought I'd have a pan bagnat, because I don't often have a pan bagnat. In fact, I've only made about 27 videos. Uh, no. Uh, there's... Oh, we are we anchois. We 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 nearly missed out on my anchois there. Um, I made a very good video about the World Pan Bagnat Championship. Mm. It's uh, it's on the channel. Have a look. Check it out. Merci, au revoir. It's Pan Bagnat time, folks. So after our pit stop, let's carry on around the port here uh, and see some of the sights. Further around here, there is one of the uh, most iconic buildings in Nice, which is the uh, La Reserve restaurant with its incredible um, sort of dining terrace that's converted from um, the old diving board. So this is La Reserve restaurant with uh, Le Plongeoir which is this incredible sort of terrace there and then a further terrace down here. Now you might be looking at that and thinking, what a strange setup. Why would it have that terrace there and then the diving board? And it looks a little bit, does it look a little bit like a galleon? Well, there's a reason for that. That's the reason. So that is the Sean Connery Villa, which he bought, I think, about 30, 40 years ago with his uh, uh, wife, who's from this area. She's called Michelin Rockbroon. The clue might be in the name. Um, and I think, actually, to this day, she still has an apartment in Villefranche. But this is a spectacular house. It's got a beautiful swimming pool right at the end of the garden here. It's got an indoor swimming pool. It's got a vast gym so Sean could keep his pecs up. And uh, it was on the market a few years ago for a cool 30 million euros. But coming up here is the famous Coco Beach Fish Restaurant, a restaurant that uh, has a rich history and that met a terrible fate. Uh, and it was established in 1936 by a man called Coco. And uh, it was just a little tiny cabin on uh, and he cooked up fresh fish that he'd caught. And, um, and then war, of course, came along and the restaurant closed. But after the war, there was still soldiers here and seamen round uh, around the bay in Villefranche and he reopened and they would apparently swim round and lay probably naked on the rocks and he would serve them uh, fishy delights and uh, it went on to become one of the most famous restaurants uh, in in town uh, it stayed in the same family right up until pretty recently when it was sold and it reopened I think in the June and in the July there was an horrendous fire 
Uh, I think 40 fire crews came from all along the coastline, but the place couldn't be saved. They managed to get the diners out. Nobody was injured. Uh, but sadly, that was the end of Cocoa Beach Restaurant. There you go, proof since 1936. But sadly, nobody's been in there for many years now. It's, uh, it's derelict. So this is where you make a turn to the right and go down the secret steps onto the Sentier du Littoral, the Sentier de Bord de Mer. Now, this area, this uh, Cocoa Beach, very popular with nudists, quite a lot of uh, gay naturists come down here and it, uh, it could get a bit frisky at night in the old days. And just along here, there used to be um, a tunnel which um, we nicknamed the, the Tunnel of Love. Um, I'm not sure there was much love going on, but there was <coughs> quite a lot of other things. Um, but the, the council, it was just under here, the council very wisely um, <laughs> took it away because it, um, well, it was antisocial behaviour, I think they'd term it now. Of course, there's a long and uh, rich history of naturism in France. Uh, still many, many naturist beaches along this coastline. Uh, topless bathing is still very popular with the ladies, though interestingly, apparently it's becoming less popular with the younger generation, for whatever reason. Um, and uh, even old Jean Cocteau, the famous uh, painter who, and poet and filmmaker who lived down here and spent an awful lot of time in in Villefranche. This was a, a favourite hangout of Cocteau's, these rocks. And uh, a little bit further around this corner, I'm going to tell you all about um, the Palais Maeterlinck and when Cocteau visited it. Up until a few years ago, this path used to be uh, a lot more fragile than it is now and you really were taking your life in your hands to get round here particularly when the sea is rough um, it does often get closed if the sea rough and there's a chance of what the french call a coup de mer but uh, you do have to be careful because people come down here and they think oh fantastic let's watch some waves let's do some storm chasing um, and i'm afraid every year there are fatalities you can see there's some uh, incredible apartment blocks clinging onto the cliff face as so many buildings do along this coastline uh, with spectacular views and up there is the incredible Palais Maeterlinck now if you can see that fence behind me well that fence up to um, about five or six years ago did not exist but the Palais Maeterlinck was bought uh, by a Czech billionaire and he decided he wanted to uh, take it back to being uber expensive apartments and I'm talking in the millions if not tens of millions. Uh, unfortunately he then realized that there were an awful lot of nude bathers down here and that perhaps his billionaire mates didn't want to um, didn't want to look out their um, billionaire windows and see billions of um, uh, boys um, enjoying themselves. So he put a security guard at the bottom, this is true, of the, uh, uh, the lift um, uh, that takes, takes people back down here to the, uh, to the platform, to the bathing platform. Um, and the nudists were a bit furious and there were sort of battles about coming over and they'd, they'd sort of go onto the platform and stage a little sort of quiet protest. But the minute the security guard saw them with no clothes on, he'd come scuttling down from the hotel, presumably there was a camera, uh, and blow his whistle and send them off. So it was, <laughs> it was this uh, battle that went on. But one of the great advantages of the, the pandemic is that, um, well, the billionaires didn't come, the security guard disappeared, the lift ceased to work, and the platform was reclaimed again by, by the nudists and by the people. Now, 
I am told by people who know that this path used to go right the way along the coastline to Villefranche. Now, I'm never entirely sure I can believe it because I can't really see how the path would have sort of clung onto the cliff face, but people say it did. But sadly, now it doesn't, although that's a bonus for us because it means after we've climbed the seven million steps to, uh, to Mont Baron, that we're going to go up and get the most fantastic view from the Palais Maeterlinck and see the wonderful Chateau Anglais, which is where we're going to end our journey today. So um, come with me up the staircase to heaven. I have to confess, I am not looking forward to this. the handrail on this bit. <sighs> and the wonderful thing is that when you get to here and you're feeling relieved and you think, oh, I've done it, I've escaped, I'm free, there's another set of steps. Now just a little hill to go up. Once we get up this hill, we're back on Boulevard Carno, the main route uh, on the Basque Corniche from Nice to Monaco into Italy. Uh, and uh, you'll recognize where I am when I get to the top here. Because I dare say, anybody who's ever been to Villefranche or Nice will have visited this place. About to give you the big reveal. Do you know where we are yet? It's my Rolf Harris impression again. Da, 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 da. There you go, Carrefour Market, the supermarket previously known as Champion. Now, rather than take you on a tour of Carrefour Market, I'm going to take you to the Chateau Anglais, which is one of the great belly pot follies. We saw it from the path down below, but now we're going to get a close up of this absolutely insane villa which was actually built by an Englishman. And it was an Englishman who'd helped restore the Red Fort in Delhi and he decided to recreate some of it here in Nice. I just want to show you one last thing before we wrap up this video because I want to take you along here to the Maeterlinck viewing point. Yeah, one of the intriguing things about Maeterlinck and his relationship with uh, the actress who was at the time just 18 when he met her, he met her on the set of his play and at the time, his then partner, who he'd been with a long time, and I think he couldn't marry because she was previously married, was the acting tutor. So she didn't end up with this palais, but René did. This is Cocteau writing in 1953. March the 2nd, 1953, around 5 a.m., I went to see Mrs. Maeterlinck. I couldn't find the entrance to the villa. We were prowling on the platform overlooking the road. We leaned towards the covered gardens, ponds surrounded by green plants. The villa is huge. It's like something in Egypt, an Egyptian temple. 
Madame Maeterlinck lives in these halls, these corridors, these vast, immense vestibules, with a tiny peak in his knees and a ghost of Maeterlinck. And down below, nudists meet on its deserted beach. So you get a picture of René Dahan as this, uh, well, Sunset Boulevard-like figure, don't you? And interestingly, I just noticed something, because I'd read that the ashes of the two of them were interred somewhere in the grounds, and I presumed they'd be inside the palais. But if you look over here, amazingly, here are the remains of Maurice Maeterlinck and René Maeterlinck Niederhorn. So that brings us to the end of leg two of our journey from the Negresco Hotel in Nice to the Chapelle Saint Hospice on Saint Jean. Next time, we're gonna take up our journey from here. We're gonna go up into Montberon, up to the Fort de Montalbon, around the villa of Sir Elton John, and then take the magical old cart track back down into Villefranche. Join me then. If you've enjoyed this video, don't forget to subscribe. Please give us a like. Won't cost you a penny. Makes a huge difference to the algorithm. And I love you forever. I'll see you on the next one. Thanks for watching. Bye.